right. Well, thanks all for joining us. Um, uh, this will be the second to last uh, sustainable energy seminar of the fall 21, 2021 semester. Um, if this is your first time, my name is Scott Williams. I'm the research and education coordinator at the Wisconsin Energy Institute. And the sustainable energy seminar is held every other week uh, in the fall and spring with the goal of highlighting different uh, energy researchers from across campus and the ways that different disciplines understand energy challenges and develop solutions. Uh, throughout the series, uh, you'll hear from folks from uh, social sciences and humanities to engineering and physical sciences um, to learn about the many ways in which uh, uh, our scholars on campus uh, understand sustainable energy challenges and develop solutions. Um, so this seminar is open to the public, um, but it's also a course for students in the Certificate in Engineering for Energy Sustainability, as well as the Master's in Sustainable Systems Engineering. Um, we'll be offering this webinar uh, in the online webinar format for the rest of the fall semester. Uh, we're still seeing what will happen uh, with the pandemic in the spring, but we'll let you know. Um, we do have one more uh, seminar coming up in two weeks. So uh, if you'd like to sign up for that one, you can use the same registration link that you used for today's seminar. Uh, I have live, trad, uh, live captioning turned on. Uh, you can toggle that feature in the live transcript button um, toward the bottom of your screen. Um, you can introduce yourself in the chat if you like. Uh, otherwise, if you have a question for our uh, guest speaker today, uh, you can use the Q&A uh, box and I'll be monitoring that uh, to uh, relay the questions to the speaker. So with that, I'll introduce today's uh, speaker is uh, Leah Horowitz. Uh, she's an assistant professor in the Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies, as well as the Department of Civil Society and Community Studies. Uh, Dr. Horowitz is a critical cultural geographer who uses ethnographic methods to examine grassroots engagements with environmental issues. And through this research, she's exploring the cultural complexities and the power dynamics of tensions surrounding the management and exploitation of natural resources and how that affects uh, various modes of environmental government governance. So today she'll be giving uh, kind of a historical background and chronology of the Standing Rock Sioux tribe and their resistance to the Dakota Access Pipeline and the movement that developed into the No Dakota Access Pipeline movement. So welcome, Professor Horowitz. All right, well, thank you, Scott, for the invitation and the nice introduction. Um, I'd like to start off, uh, first of all, today by just taking a moment to acknowledge that the University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land. Uh, it's a place that their nation has called Tejop since time immemorial. Now, if I can control my slides. Oh, there we go. Um, my understanding is that you are pretty much engineering stud students for the most part. Is that right? For uh, the students that are in the class, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, the list of uh, lectures that I saw for this course so far at least seem to be all pretty much focused on engineering issues. So this lecture is going to be a little bit of an outlier because it's not going to be about engineering. Uh, or even physical or biological sciences. It's going to be about social science. It's actually going to be kind of about how the results of engineering projects can impact local communities. And in this case, it's an indigenous community. And we're going to talk about how the community might respond to those impacts. Uh, now, some of those engineering projects have been in the news a fair bit lately. Uh, those are oil carrying pipelines. So as you can see on the map, we have quite a lot of oil pipelines in the US. And this map doesn't even include natural gas or other, other pipelines, just oil pipelines. Now, as you might imagine or expect, Texas and Louisiana, as you can see on the map there, they have even more than we do. But over in the Midwest, you know, we have our fair share as well. Now, I'm going to focus on a particular pipeline, actually the Dakota Access Pipeline or DAPL for short, and the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. Now, I've been doing some research on DAPL, and um, mainly I've been, lately especially, I've been using an approach called studying up, and that involves shifting the analytical focus away from the kind of ethnographic work that I had always done in the past, in order to, as Laura Nader put it back in 1972, and I quote, to study the colonizers rather than the colonized. 
uh, the culture of power rather than the culture of, of powerlessness, the culture of, of affluence rather than the culture of poverty. And the idea behind that is twofold. One, it avoids the risk of harm to a vulnerable population. And secondly, if you want to, under, if you want to change power structures and the ultimate aim of critical human geography, which is what I do, uh, the ultimate aim is emancipatory. You have to, to, to change them, you have to understand them. So I spent some time at the Standing Rock Sioux tribe talking with folks there, you know, after obtaining the tribe's permission, of course. And I also did obtain a certificate of confidentiality from the National Institutes of Health, which kind of adds another layer of protection for anybody who's participating in the research. So I've done some of that, but I've mainly been studying up various elites that are involved in the Dakota Access Pipeline for my own research. But today, I, I'd just like to provide some background to help us understand what actually happened um, at, around DAPL, the No DAPL movement. So let's start with a map and a little bit of history. So this is the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe Reservation. And as you can see, it stretches uh, kind of across the border between North and South Dakota. And the people who live there are mainly uh, Lakota and Dakota, which are part of what is now called the Sioux Nation. Although Sioux is a misnomer from the colonial era, and there are kind of different versions of the story of where that name <laughs> originally came from, but it is still the name officially used by the US government. But a better term would be Ocheti Sakoim, which means seven council fires, which reflects the seven tribes that make up that nation. So that's a map of the present day Standing Rock Reservation. Let's take a step back in time. So, you know, as you can see, uh, the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota people used to travel all over the lands that are now called North and South Dakota, as well as Montana. Wyoming and Nebraska. And they traveled a lot, especially in the summer when they would hunt buffalo. And in 1851, uh, as in this map, the US government made a treaty with the Sioux in which they recognized their land rights. And at that time, the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota inhabited about 100 million acres of land. And they agreed to allow settler colonists to pass through their lands in exchange for the US government making payments to the tribes for 50 years. Now, it didn't take long for the US to break that treaty. The very next year, 1852, they decreased their promise of payments from 50 years down to 10. Now, in 1868, as you can see in that top map there, uh, there was another treaty, and that established what was called the Great Sioux Reservation which was essentially only the South Dakota portion of that earlier treaty. And then over the next couple of decades, as you can see in those maps, in spite of the government's promises and despite objections by the native peoples, their lands got reduced and reduced again and broken into several pieces. Now, over the years, the Standing Rock Reservation itself dwindled to about 1 million acres of land. So compare that to the original 100 million that the Lakota and Dakota used to live on. And it's one of the larger of the reservations in the US. Now, among that land that was stolen is that kind of triangle uh, on the left-hand side of that second map there, the triangle that's cut out, that's actually the uh, Black Hills, which is the most sacred place for the Lakota people. And it was illegally stolen, not seeded, as this map says, the uh, Supreme Court has upheld the, the, the decision that it was, in the decision they decided it was stolen and by breaking the treaty of 1868. And that happened as soon as settlers found gold in those hills in 1876. And it's a point of contention to this very day. So the US government has actually offered the Lakota people money, a good sum of money in exchange for their lands, but they have refused to take that money because. They just want the land back. Now, a little more recently in 1948, the Army Corps of Engineers began constructing the Oahe Dam in South Dakota 
Now, this is despite intense opposition from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribal Council. Now, the dam took over 10 years to build, and it created the fourth largest reservoir in the US. And it also destroyed more Native American land than any other public works project. So this lake that you can see here uh, was created from the river that uh, that lake actually uh, flooded a lot of the timber land on the Standing Rock uh, Reservation and the Cheyenne River Re Reservation as well. Now, all you know, as you might imagine, the most valuable land is always going to be along the river because that's where the water is, right? So living things need water, uh, surprisingly enough. And so, you know, that was the, the most valuable timberland, that was most of the rangeland, the valuable rangeland, right? Animals need to drink water. Um, it also destroyed much of the gardens and cultivated areas that were along there, and of course the wild fruit and the wildlife resources. And many of the people who were living on this reservation along the river got displaced and their homes are now underwater. Now, the Iwaii Dam was actually the last of four dams that submerged American Indian lands along a 700 mile stretch of the Missouri River. So, there is a picture of the chairman of another tribal council in North Dakota, whose orchard is just upstream of Standing Rock. And there he's watching the Secretary of the Interior sign away his tribe land rights in 1948. And if that picture just doesn't just about break your heart, I don't know what will. So that's the history of the Standing Rock Reservation. And meanwhile, on the Standing Rock Reservation, average per capita income is half of the average per capita income in the US. Okay, enough background. The, I will see history matters. Okay, so what about the Dakota Access Pipeline? Well, it's a pipeline, <clears throat> surprisingly enough. And it stretches nearly 1,200 mi miles. It carries up to 570,000 barrels per day of what's called light sweet crude that's extracted in North Dakota at those where those green stars are up there. And it's getting shipped to the other green star at the bottom right hand corner, which is a refinery in Illinois. Um, this is an aside. The reason that they call it light and sweet is that the drillers, uh, when they hit oil, they used to actually taste the oil to determine what kind it was. And you know it's a hydrocarbon, so apparently it tasted sweet. I, I can't speak from personal experience on that one. So this pipeline here cost over $3.7 billion to build. And the project uh, is owned by Energy Transfer. You speak at the time it was Energy Transfer Partners, not just Energy Transfer, and they're based in Texas. And here's the person who owns that company, CEO, Kelsey Warren, worth about $4 billion. Now, when the pipeline route was being designed back in 2014, and I'm a little bit partial to this map because a friend of mine made it and it went viral. I still see it published in places like the New York Times to this very day. So that's a kind of cool little thing there <laughs> for me. Um, so when this pipeline route was being designed, right, that was back in 2014, and the first route that was considered would have been that dotted line there that goes just about 10 miles north of Bismarck, right? You can see there that yellow splotch. Uh, so Bismarck is about 90% white. But the US Army Corps of Engineers decided quite early on that that was not a viable route because it would threaten Bismarck's water supply. And they called it a high consequence area because a spill, if a spill were to occur there, that would in their view have serious consequences. So <clears throat> it ended up down that <clears throat> with that solid black line, just a half a mile uh, just from the Standing Rock to the reservation, just half an hour away. Uh, and now, incidentally, Standing Rock gets all of its water from the Missouri River in the Kauai. Remember that, <laughs> that lake was created by the Army Corps of Engineers. So, um, so the Corps, uh, as I'll talk about in a little, in a little moment, uh, issued a permit to allow the pipeline to cross under Lake Kauai. And in issuing this permit, it made the following statement, and I quote, given the engineering design, proposed installation methodology, quality of material selected, operations measures, and response plans, the risk of an inadvertent release 
in or reaching Lake Oahe is extremely low. And of course, this raises the question, if the risk of a quote unquote release, which is actually uh, a kind of a euphemism for a spill, it's how the oil industry refers to a spill, release of oil is low, that risk is low, why not put the pipeline near Bismarck? Okay, so now that we know the history of the Standing Rock Reservation and its relationship to the Army Corps of Engineers, that knowledge can help us to understand the context a little bit better. Now, if the pipeline can legally be put there because it's not on the actual reservation, it might help to remember that those lands were all Lakota lands before they were taken away. Now, even in the 1868 treaty, which was illegally broken, all the land up to Bismarck belonged to the Lakota. And the more recent history that we just learned about can help us to understand the response from the people of Standing Rock. Now remember, the decision to allow the pipeline to go under Lake Oahe was made by the Army Corps. That's the same Corps that built the Oahe Dam, you know, about just, just over 60 years previously, so within living memory. And that dam was built to generate hydroelectricity, but the residents of the reservation have always paid just the same for electricity as anyone else, despite the fact that, as we just learned, the flooding from the dam destroyed much of their land and harmed them economically. All right, so let's look at the tribe's engagements with ETP and the Corps. So the tribe's first contact with the pipeline company and energy transfer partners occurred on September 30th, 2014. The company went to the tribe and met with the tribal council and some members of the tribal administration, including the tribe's archaeologist and the tribe's tribal historical preservation officer. Now, the company representatives, in their own words, considered this to be a, quote, informational meeting. In other words, they clearly expected they would just go in and provide the tribe with information about what they were going to do, that is to say, build the Dakota Access Pipeline, and not to ask for the tribe's input, let alone their approval of the project. And in fact, the government agency that's responsible for permitting the pipelines crossing under the Missouri River, right, the Army Corps of Engineers, actually didn't bother turning up for this meeting. But the tribe did take the opportunity to voice their concerns about the pipeline. They explained that just the day before, they had passed a tribal resolution to oppose the pipeline. And they objected to the fact that, in their view, they were not being adequately consulted about the locations of cultural sites along the pipeline route. This was obviously a concern because construction could disturb or could destroy those sites. And they're concerned about the pipeline's potential to rupture underneath the Missouri River and contaminate their drinking water. Well, one tribal council member explained that pipelines, in his words, all leak no matter what. It's going to happen and it's going to ruin that water that we consume and that future generations are going to consume. Now, the chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux tribe at that time, David Archambo II, told the DAPA representatives, we know that we can live without oil. We know that we can live without money, but we can't live without water. So we're always doing what we can to protect that and also to protect our cultural sites. Now, the immediate response from the company representative was, and I quote, if there's any time that you or other members of council would want to have any description of some of the monitoring safety programs that we have in place to ensure that we operate the pipeline safely and that there are not leaks in the pipeline, we'd be glad to share that information with you. So clearly, this was about informing the community, not delegating or let alone empowering. And the company clearly was not listening to the tribe. In fact, a few months later, without any further consultation with the tribe, Energy Transfer, Transfer Partners went ahead and applied for a permit to build the Dakota Access Pipeline. Now, oil pipelines, unlike other pipelines, such as natural gas, don't require any federal permit for construction per se. <clears throat> Most of the permitting is actually done at the state level. 
but they do require federal permits for activities that might discharge dredge or fill materials into uh, or cross or otherwise affect waters of the United States. <clears throat> but these permits can get pre-approved under something called a nationwide permit. And that pre-authorizes a group of similar activities uh, when each of those activities is considered to have only minor impacts on waters and wetlands. And it can be considered a cumulative impact only individually. So the DAPL water crossings were permitted under this nationwide permit 12. So the vast majority of those water crossings did not actually require the company, ETP, to, to contact US Army Corps of Engineers before construction. But nonetheless, uh, ETP did need to request an easement in order to cross Corps managed federally owned land at the Missouri River. And this triggered Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, NHPA. Uh, and that requires federal agencies to consider impacts on historic properties of activities in which they engage or which they permit. And so this meant they had to consult with the local communities whose cultural heritage might be impacted by their projects, namely the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. But interestingly enough, the law did not require any consultation regarding the environmental aspects of the project. Now, meanwhile, <clears throat> the Army's structure is very hierarchical and rigid, as you might imagine, and that could get in the way of mutually respectful communication and positive relationships with the tribes, particularly regarding consultation processes. So the tribal members with whom I spoke observed that core employees were only willing to follow their own agency rules, and they largely ignored or resented tribal protocols and practices. In particular, the core tended to rush through consultation procedures rather than taking the time to give each tribal member a chance to speak as in accordance with tribal protocols. Now this rush reflected the Army's cultural norm of completing projects quickly. So they viewed any concerns or objections from tribes as a distraction from their mission. And the Corps' mission or, or its main interest lay in building the nation's infrastructure. And they prioritized what they viewed as the national interest over the interests of local tribes. But as I mentioned, this permitting process was mainly carried out at the state level. And North Dakota is very heavily dependent on oil for its economy. So in January 2016, regulators in the state of North Dakota went ahead and unanimously approved the pipeline. Now at this point, indigenous pipeline opponents began to actively demonstrate against the DAPL project. So on April 1st, 2016, a group of 200 American Indians from Standing Rock, but also from other nations in North and South Dakota, came together to hold a protest on horseback. And after North Dakota permitted DAPL, the protesters, or water protectors, as many prefer to be called, they set up a camp near the point where the pipeline would cross the river. Now the camp started off with just a few people, but soon new camps started to form and they ended up with thousands of people from all over the world. And this kind of mobilization was possible because the tribe was able to send out a powerful message and largely through social media. So campers could choose whether they would remain at the camp and help with day-to-day -day maintenance activities like cooking, setting up tents, etc or whether they wanted to go out and perform protest actions. Now, sometimes those actions were deliberately legal and sometimes they were illegal, things like trespassing on the construction site. Now, this is called civil disobedience, as you may know, and as again, as you may know, it has a long history, both within the US and around the world. Now, sometimes people went into an action knowing that they were going to be arrested, or that there was at least a good chance that they would be arrested, but many others ended up getting arrested when they didn't intend to. 
And for things like trespassing, and I didn't realize that they were, or for quote unquote disorderly conduct when they just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now this even included some journalists who were there trying to cover the story and they ended up getting arrested and even spending a few days in jail. Now in late April, 2016, the Standing Rock Sioux petitioned the Corps to do a more thorough environmental impact study of the project. But three months later, on July 25th, 2016, the Corps provided the final approvals that would allow the pipeline to go ahead and cross the Missouri. Now the very next day, the Standing Rock Sioux tribe sued the Corps and sought an emergency stop to the construction. Their case was heard in federal court about a month later in August 2016. Now the tribe claimed that they had not been adequately consulted about the project and that they had grave concerns about the project's environmental impacts and also about the potential destruction of places that were sacred to them. Speaking of sacred places, about a week after the tribe filed the lawsuit on September 3rd, 2016, energy transfer partners started to work in an area that the tribe, as well as the Society of American Archaeologists, claimed contained ancient burial sites and other potentially other cultural artifacts. So ATP dug up an area about 150 feet wide and two miles long. Protesters, as you can see in the image there, tried to stop them. And then the security guards arrived and attacked them with dogs and pepper spray. There turned out that those security guards did not have the permit, proper permits to operate in North Dakota. So <laughs> who was the one being illegal there? Now, six days later, a federal judge denied the tribe's request to put a temporary halt on the project. And the tribe appealed. But then, a few hours later, the Department of Justice, Department of the Interior, and Department of the Army issued a statement to the effect that they needed more time to revisit the decision to permit the project. And so they asked ETP to pause construction voluntarily. But the company refused to do that. And then on October 9th, 2016, just before Columbus Day, which a lot of American Indians find offensive to celebrate because it marks the beginning of what they view as a genocide. On that day, a federal judge denied the tribe's appeal and said that ETP could continue construction. So around this time, some of the water protectors started to get fed up with lobbying strategies because they didn't seem to be working. Now, something important to note here is that the tribal authorities who were at the camp, they were always urging the water protesters to remain peaceful and in prayer. So they had actually consulted a medicine man at the beginning when the camps were getting set up. And he had a vision that told him that if the water protectors managed to stay peaceful, they would succeed. But after a while, as the camps swelled to thousands of people, and most of them were not native, they didn't always listen to the elders. And they started to do their own thing. And it wasn't always peaceful. So eventually, the elders realized that they weren't being listened to anymore. And a lot of them just left the camp. And the actions did get more and more disruptive. On October 27, 2016, protesters set up a roadblock on a state highway with burning tires. But if you want to consider that violent, you have to consider the police response. So when the police moved to dismantle this barricade, uh, witnesses claim that the police used tear gas, pepper spray, and a sound cannon. They arrested 141 people. Uh, they brought, which brought the total number of arrests since the start of the protest to 400. And by the end of the protests, a few months later, this number would be about double that, over 800 people. Now, the United Nations condemned what they viewed as an excessive use of police force. Then on November 20th, so shortly before Thanksgiving, which is another holiday that a lot of Native people find offensive for obvious reasons, water protectors and police clashed again. The police deployed water cannons and aimed them, ironically enough, at water protectors in below freezing temperatures. Dozens of people suffered hypothermia and sometimes took hours just to regain normal consciousness. Then on November 25th, 2016, the Army Corps of Engineers issued an eviction notice. They ordered protesters to leave their camp by December 5th. But 
on December 4th, on the advice of then President Obama, the Corps decided to revoke the permit to cross Lake Oahe, and they decided to conduct a more extensive environmental impact statement that would examine alternative pipeline routes. So water protectors celebrated their victory. But of course, by that time, there was a new president-elect who had already made it clear that he favored the pipeline. Kelsey Warren, you remember the picture of the CEO of Energy Transfer Partners, Kelsey Warren was apparently banking on this happening because he had donated over $100,000 to the Trump campaign. Kennedy, just a few days after taking office, President Trump signed an executive memorandum that urged the Army Corps of Engineers to go ahead and approve the pipeline. And just a few days later, they did grant the final permit. Water protectors got evicted from the camps, the pipeline got completed, and that summer, oil started flowing through it. But just around the same time that the oil started flowing, a federal judge decided that the Army Corps had made a mistake in just suddenly deciding that DAPL didn't need an environmental impact study after all. So they would have to do one. But he also decided that the Corps might be able to justify its decision not to conduct a full review in the first place, even though it had to do one now. And apparently that was an adequate reason to allow the oil to keep flowing for the time being. And not surprisingly, the Corps went back and did a little study and decided in August 2018 that indeed it had been right all along in issuing a permit for DAPL. Now the Standing Rock Sioux tribe claimed that the Corps had not, in this process, had not addressed the tribe's concerns. And they continued to pursue their legal battle against the Corps. Nonetheless, DAPL doubled down, literally. The company proposed to double the pipeline's capacity to 1.1 million barrels of crude oil per day. So public hearings on this proposal were held in November 2019 in North Dakota, and the tribe and the pipeline experts who were working with them expressed opposition to this expansion. Now, meanwhile, that federal court in D.C., they were still deliberating over the tribe's request to shut the DAPL down. And then in March 2020, Standing Rock Sioux Tribe and the No DAPL Movement achieved a victory when the federal judge ruled that indeed the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had violated the National Environmental Protection Act by issuing permits for the pipeline back in 2016. And the judge said that the Corps would in fact need to prepare a full EIS, Environmental Impact Study. And of course, this is what the tribe had been asking for all along. But then the judge still had to decide whether or not the oil actually had to stop flowing, given that the pipeline no longer had a permit to operate. So that technically now the oil is flowing illegally. Now, of course, the company in the core asked for it to be allowed to keep flowing, and they were supported by the state of North Dakota, along with industry groups. Nonetheless, in July of 2020, the same judge decided the energy transfer would have to halt Staples operations while waiting for the completion of the EIS. But, of course, you know, he appealed, and a higher court, the D.C. Court of Appeals, decided that the oil could keep flowing, even though they're now doing so illegally, without a permit. In the meantime, the EIS process officially began in September 2020. Because of the pandemic, <clears throat> they actually had to hold public meetings, public hearings online, virtually, like we're doing now <laughs> on Zoom, I think. And meanwhile, the tribe and its allies kept up their demands to have the pipeline shut down, but so far without success. But even though the No Double Movement did not achieve its primary aim of shutting down the pipeline per se, it did have a lot of effects at different scales. So for one thing, at the grassroots scale, indigenous activists learned a lot. Some people felt discouraged, but others felt empowered, and they went on to participate in other pipeline fights. They learned how powerful social media can be they also learned that that power can be dangerous, such as when activists came from all over the world but didn't always listen to the elders. And Standing Rock made waves among the investment community as well. So three out of the 17 banks that were financing the pipeline withdrew their investments. 
Several cities also put pressure on the banks by threatening to close their accounts with banks that continued to fund the pipeline. And so banks got together and they revised the employer principles, which are a set of voluntary guidelines that help banks to figure out how they can invest in socially responsible projects, how they can screen those projects to make sure that they're socially responsible according to these principles. Okay, so we've talked about activists and investors. What about governments? Well, they learned different lessons. So in 2016, at the height of the actions at Standing Rock, as you remember, the Obama administration saw what was happening as a sign that they needed to rethink the tribal consultation policies. And so the Department of the Interior, the Department of the Army, and the Department of Justice went around to 59 tribes across the US and they requested and they received input from those tribes on how federal decision-making processes around infrastructure and the project, how those processes could allow, could better allow for timely and meaningful tribal input. And in January, 2017, they produced a report entitled Improving, uh, Improving Tribal Consultation and uh, Tribal Involvement in Federal Infrastructure Decisions. So, January 2017, and as you, as you know, a few days later, the administration changed. So it may not have gotten consulted very much, uh, no pun intended, consulted. Um, it may not have gotten very much attention over the subsequent four years, but the moment of COVID is being dusted off now. Now, state governments around the US took note as well, but they learned different lessons. So obviously they didn't want something like that to occur in their own state. But instead of seeing this as an opportunity to improve their consultation practices, which the federal government was trying to do, Instead, there was a wave, and still going, of what are called critical infrastructure laws. So these new laws make it a felony to protest near oil and gas infrastructure. And they can carry a penalty of multiple years in jail. Now, so far, 20 states have enacted this type of legislation. And on November 21st, 2019, our own Wisconsin Join the list when Governor Evers signed an AB to 426 into law. And this bill says that trespassing on the property of, quote, any company that operates a gas, oil, petroleum, or uh, uh, product, renewable fuel, uh, water, or chemical generation, storage, transportation, or delivery system, any trespassing on that property would now be a class H felony, which means it's punishable by up to six years in prison and a fine of $10,000. Now, interestingly, Wisconsin also has under a 1953 law called Public Law 280, it has the authority to prosecute most crimes that occur on most Indian reservations. And this gets interesting because the Bad River Reservation in northern Wisconsin, um, an Ojibwe reservation in northern Wisconsin, there's a pipeline called Line 5. And it had an easement for multiple decades. It had an easement to go through the reservation. And that easement came up for renewal in 2013. And the tribe said no. They denied the company, which is Enbridge, a Canadian company, uh, which incidentally is the same company that owns Line 3, it's another highly controversial pipeline in the, uh, going, has a tiny little bit in Wisconsin, but mainly going through Minnesota, coming from Canada, carrying car sales. Um, so the same company. And so the tribe denied them the renewal of that easement. They told Enbridge to get the pipeline out of their reservation, which it has yet to do. So the tribe claims that the company is trespassing on their land. But according to this new critical infrastructure law, if the tribal members protest near the pipeline, even though it's there illegally, and they are on tribal land, that if they protest there, they could be thrown in jail. So there's a summary of my um, talk today. 
and I was asked to leave some time for questions. So I will happily take any questions. Thanks, Leah. Uh, so feel free to uh, put your questions in the Q and A box. Um, so I might looks like we got maybe one coming in. I, I wonder if I can start out with a question. Um, given that you know there's a lot of uh, new infrastructure uh, legislation going through the federal government, um, you know the bipartisan infrastructure bill, possibly the Build Back Better uh, Act. What are some of the lessons? beyond um, you know the oil and gas industry but other sorts of infrastructure especially clean energy infrastructure what lessons can we learn um, if it if these uh, projects do have an impact on tribal communities yeah it's a great question so it's it's tough because climate justice has to especially indigenous climate justice has to take account not only of concerns about climate change which obviously indigenous people are very concerned about as well but also concerns about the injustices that have been done to indigenous people by the same agencies, right? The same government agencies that are now um, hopefully addressing climate change, but they have to be careful to do it in a way that's not going to exacerbate those injustices, right? So, um, <clears throat> you know, not only pipelines, which hopefully is not <laughs> going to be part of that, Right, the attempt to address climate change, obviously. Um, but even things like uh, wind farms can be uh, detrimental if they're on land that's considered sacred. Right. So, I mean, these are these are issues that can be avoided. Right. And other there are other issues too, like in other countries, uh, hydroelectric dams are um, cause massive displacements of people, sometimes indigenous peoples, even if they have, by some accounts, have a lesser impact. There's also issues regarding the rotting vegetation and nutrient that's released. Um, so it's uh, not quite sure, not drays a bit out as to whether that makes much of a lesser climate impact. But um, other ones are things like, you know, nuclear energy is often proposed as a, as a means of reducing climate change. But then what about the uranium mining that has occurred, for example, on Navajo lands, there's a long history of uranium mining uh, and that's caused massive health impacts and cancers in the community that never knew cancer before that happened. So, you know, uh, obviously it can be done, but it has to be done very carefully and in consultation and not just consultation, but consent with the consent of the communities that are being, you know, addressed and, and hopefully not impacted by these projects. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question from Jackson. Um, I was wondering why did the Bad River Band decide not to renew the rights, uh, rights of way easement for the pipeline after more than 60 years and what changed? Yeah, um, well, one thing that changed is they, you know, there's more awareness of climate change and oil spill related issues. They're very concerned about their wild rights which is incredibly important, not only for subsistence as a food resource, but culturally uh, very, very important to the Ojibwe people. Um, and uh, it's just very, very deep cultural importance. It's actually um, part of their kind of um, origins of being in Wisconsin and, and in the Great Lakes area, because they were originally, they were kind of on the East Coast up in kind of uh, kind of along the coast up there in what's now Canada, and they, they, they left, they traveled across, they traveled west, um, back towards the, the Great Lakes region, which, you know, they didn't know was there, but they were traveling, and they were told by their creator, just keep going until you reach the place where food grows on the water, right, and so, okay, and they kept going and kept going um, multiple generations, and so they got to the place where food grows on the water, which is the wild rice. And so that's such a huge part of their culture now. Uh, it brings a community together uh, every year. They have the harvest and preparation. So it's a it's very important. So they're concerned that an, an oil pipeline rupture in the Kukagan sloughs up there where they do the wild ricing that would destroy that resource. So, you know, there wasn't necessarily as much awareness or as much ability to push back at, the, you know, 60 odd years ago, right? Um, communities didn't have that kind of power, but 
now they're becoming having more of a voice and taking the opportunities to self empower and and have more take more of a stance when they feel the need to. So that's what's changed in the last sixty years. They feel that they can they're ready to stand up to pipeline companies or people coming through their lands. Mm -hmm. Maybe to follow up, do you find that's generally generally more the case maybe across the U.S. is Communities have more power, or more awareness, and or you know having a stronger voice than they did, you know, several decades ago. Yeah, I mean, it it started a lot of it came from about through the AIM movement, the American Indian movement in the seventies, taking of Alcatraz, really, you know, exerting exerting their power, and that's carried through. Um, I mean, we're obviously seeing a lot of changes now. We have. Um, you know, uh, Deb Holland and Sharice uh, uh, Davis, who were, um, well, they were in the in, in Congress, and now uh, obviously Deb Holland is the Secretary of the Interior. We just uh, just recently there's been a, a, a new uh, appointee of the National Park Service, who is also American Indian person. So, you know, it's they're they're obviously getting more of a voice in the government uh, currently. So. Uh, you know, yeah, that's that's something that's definitely evolving. Still, but still, so there's a way to go because the the pipeline companies, right, are still pushing their way through. And what, what's the the power that they have is the power of money, the power to, to you know promise all sorts of financial benefits to the state. Of North Dakota, for example, or other states, and then you know, politics. You know, um, with the you know, Citizens United decision, uh, corporations are persons who can give unlimited amounts of money um, in, toward political ads and uh, campaigns. So, money is very much in politics. We've got a question from Kermit. Uh, yes. It seems like a blatant string of inequities define the Standing Rock de, uh, Dapple Saga. Has any redress or recompense uh, occurred for the tribe? Has any consequences been dealt out to the companies or security forces responsible? Nope. <laughs> Some answer. Nope. Um, the, the security forces, no. Uh, student asked me that in class today about um, security forces in that regard. Uh, no. Um, there's nothing. The UN, United Nations condemned the excessive use of police force, but not the state of North Dakota, right, where they're located. So, and Wisconsin, even, I mean, they, they were getting police from all over, including Wisconsin. Um, some people may recall um, back when that was happening, it was, uh, we had Scott Walker in, in charge, and, you know, it was, um, they were sending troops over from from uh, from Wisconsin over to support the the, the um, or police for police over from Wisconsin to support the police in in North Dakota. So there was there's been no real consequence for them um, for the tribes. Has there been any compensation? Not from the government. Um, you know they they received some support from from uh, donors who helped them to start a solar farm on the reservation and things like that, but. Certainly not from the company or from the government. We've got a uh, question from Jed. Uh, is there a requirement that the pipeline be removed? Uh, I assume you're referring to, to DAPL if, if, if the environmental impact statement plays out in a certain way. Is that maybe you could clarify that question? Oh, if the, you mean if the environmental impact statement were to show that it would have severe impacts on mm -hmm. the tribe? The, the environmental impact statement is being performed by a company that's been advocating for the pipeline. <laughs> okay, so it's not gonna, there's zero chance that they're going to say that it has to be shut down. Sadly. I mean, it's just, it's just not gonna happen. And it's flowing, the oil is flowing now. No, no one's gonna really have the political courage to say you have to stop the oil that's already flowing through this pipeline. Right, it would be a huge undertaking to, to shut that down at this point. It's not gonna happen. I guess another question that occurs to me, there's so many 
appeals and uh, you know such a lengthy legal battle. Who is sort of supporting the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe to stay in and you know go through the entire process appeals processes? Mm -hmm. They have they work on, they're working with mainly well they have a, a kind of a team of lawyers several lawyers a lot of them did it um, a lot of them have long standing relationships with the tribe so they did it um, for much you know much cheaper than any you know, other lawyers might have done. Um, and they have, um, uh, they have, uh, they're mainly working with Earth Justice because they do a pro bono. Earth Justice is a non-governmental, you know, organization. It's a nonprofit. It, it gets money from donations. And so they're not charging the tribe anything. Um, but yeah, so yeah, and they do get a lot of donations, but that's another story that I'm not going to get to. <laughs> And Jen has another question. It says, line three in Minnesota is left to rot in place unless agreements were made with tribal units for the old line to be removed as a bargaining chip. So maybe that's clarifying the previous question. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the line three got completed in my understanding in October. It actually, the oil started flowing through, um, but the, the, you know, it was not stopped by, by President Biden, which was a request of the tribes. And so obviously they're very disappointed about that. Um, and, you know, so yeah, they're now pursuing other, you know, legal avenues, trying to get charges dropped. I mean, even more people were, were arrested for the line three than, the, than for the, um, from for Dapple. So over, I think something like 900 people were arrested. So they're, you know, they're doing things like trying to get the um, charges dropped against those people. And I mean, there's a lot, there's just a lot to, to, to deal with in these kinds of battles. Well, we have another minute or so to see if any more questions come in. Um, otherwise, I wanna thank you so much for your presentation. Oh, we do have one more question here. Uh, says, although you're approaching this from an objective academic frame, what lessons or takeaways might you have as, as to how each side in, uh, in the interest of nonpartisanship might have been more effective or less effective? <laughs> we want them to be less effective, right? <laughs> um, how could they have been more effective? Uh, well, I mean, I guess you're, I, I, if you um, think about partisanship, I guess you mean the government. Um, yeah, look, I mean, there's there's a there's a a little something that the United States has officially signed on to by signing the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples um, under the Obama administration, which was free, prior, and informed consent. So in theory, we need to ensure that for any project that goes through that, that it has the indigenous communities free, prior, and informed consent. But that doesn't get happen in practice. So we are you know, in international law, which doesn't have a lot of teeth, as you may know, uh, we are obligated to respect that consideration, but it just doesn't get enforced, as you can see from this example. So, um, you know, we, sh we should be um, trying to achieve that. Anytime any uh, project goes, you know, concerns any indigenous community, international law says that you have to not only consult the indigenous community, but actually, if you you know at least achieve their consent, which is not an easy prospect, I understand, but you know that is kind of the golden standard for best practice. So you know that what that was not even attempted in any by any stretch of the imagination. So yeah, that's that's what should have happened. And, um, you know, that's not just me saying that that's, that is what should have happened in international law that we sign on to. All right. Well, thank you so much for your presentation, really providing that uh, historical context and, uh, uh, yeah, great wealth of knowledge to understand all the uh, history behind that. Um, and thank you for answering the questions and uh, uh, bringing the kind of the social sciences and humanities perspective to an otherwise very uh, engineering heavy course. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you for the invitation. It's, it's fun to, to talk to a different crowd. All right, thanks. thanks and uh, we'll be joined in a couple of weeks um, from uh, Professor Sedona Chin, uh, who will be talking about uh, politicalization, uh, polarization, politi 
politicization of climate change uh, res uh, news coverage. So uh, that'll be our final uh, seminar of the semester. So hope to see many of you there. Awesome. Thanks everyone. All right.